Good morning. It's good to be with you. Not really with you, but uh, this whole year has been totally different for many of us. And that's why I've, I've entitled a message this morning, Are You Worrying? The scripture that was read this, this morning is found in Matthew 6, verse 25. I'll just read the first verse. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And yet somehow we are anxious. Somehow we are uh, preoccupied with the things that have been going on. This morning I'd like to concentrate on a couple of verses found in Matthew verse, chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Again, the, the text is Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Basically, what we're being told here is, don't worry. And yet, somehow, that's our tendency. The definition of worry is to give way to anxiety or uneasiness, to allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. It's a mental distress or an agitation resulting from concern, usually for something impending or anticipated. It's an anxiety, an instance or occurrence of distress and agitation. It's a cause of trouble or difficulty. Yet we find this even in the news today. I took several headlines from the internet and here are some of them. Americans worry about losing wages. Americans can agree that the future doesn't look good. More worries about the stock market. S&P slips on worries about earnings. Expert worry the coronavirus outbreak could cloud the 2020 general elections. And of course, then we have the results of the elections. Do we see a pattern here? There's, a gen there's generally a pattern of worry that's being projected even through our news. Is it any wonder that the world today is in a panic? And so many are looking for a leader that will promise to take care of all of their problems. The world's looking to a man, but that's part of our problem. We're looking to a man and we're not looking to God. We're not looking to his word. We tend to whitewash the word worry sometimes and we use the word concern instead. But you see, these are two different words with two different meanings. Worry is a form of torment. It's best described as what if thinking. What if this happens? What if that happens? Concern, on the other hand, is a calculated consideration, an assessment of actual danger. Whereas worrying anticipates problems and things going awry, a kind of lost control of the situation. Concern is more fact-based and geared toward problem solving. The question then surfaces, is worrying a sin? Well, we find that the scriptures are loaded with verses that encourage us not to worry. If we know that the word says what the word says and we choose not to follow the advice that it gives us, then are we sinning? Yes. Is it, is it, that disobedient, is it disobedient to go against what God's word is teaching us? Here are just, just a few passages that tell us what to do about worry and anxiety. Matthew 6, 25 that I read. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Psalm 94, 19 says, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Two totally different perspectives. Proverbs 12, 25 states, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. 
And then Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen to that. And then in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, we read, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have so many precious promises that encourage us not to worry but to trust in God instead. And yet we continue to worry about so many things. This is an obstacle to our relationship with God and that is sin. Sin is anything that separates us from our relationship with God. Worrying, however, has become so normal, so much a part of our lives, that we've forgotten the fact that worry is sin. Somehow we feel that we have to do something about the things that are meant to be placed into God's hands and left there. The scriptures are loaded with verses that encourage us not to worry. Still, we've allowed Satan to manipulate our thoughts and emotion. We allow the enemy to dominate them with worry to the point that daily lives are not based on faith but on worry. Worry has a partner, and that partner is fear. When we worry, we become fearful of things. We become fearful of situations. And that fear can be a paralyzing force that obstructs our relationship with God and with others. Christ, however, in the scriptures that I read, invites us first of all to come to him. I have six points this morning. The points aren't that long, but there are six points. The first one is the invitation. Christ says, come. Come is an imperative. It's a command. It's an exhortation, an incitement with force, a strong appeal on the will of another to do something here it also expresses an invitation. It's the desire from the compassionate heart of our Savior, appealing for us as a people to come to him to receive relief from whatever is oppressing us. It's a call to turn from whatever problems we're presently dwelling on to be placing them in his hands. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. In these verses, Jesus is in, inviting us to come to him exhausted, weary, those that have come to the end of our own strength. Maybe it's something that where we have wrong priorities. Maybe it's a wrong understanding of what God requires of us. Perhaps we've been doing the wrong things. Whatever the case may be, our efforts have proven to be discouraging, have proven to be futile. Christ calls us to come to him. Now, we also find in the same book in Matthew 4, verse 19, where Christ spoke to uh, Peter, James, and John, and he says, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Literally, Christ is saying, come after me. And that's a little bit different than come to me. Come to me is a tender call of intimacy with him. For all of us that are weary and tired, that feel burdened like we're carrying a load, this invitation is to establish a relationship with Christ. Weary invokes the image of persons exhausted from their work. Burden indicates individuals that are weighted down with heavy loads. We know that the Pharisees of that time had put more rules and regulations on the people. And Christ was telling the people to come to him, not to come to a religion. 
The scriptures tell us in Matthew 9, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And yet Christ offers us this beautiful invitation to come to him. God uses churches, he uses people, he can use theological systems. However, Christianity is a little bit different. It's an intimacy, it's a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus. It's not a system, it's not a set of rules that must be followed like the Pharisees taught and like many others teach today. Our relationship with, with, is with Christ. We're invited to walk with him, to have him by our side so we can minister as he wants. God then reaches out to the world using us, but he's there beside us. The Greek word for weary is kopopio, which means to labor, to toil, to expend great effort in hard and disagreeable work. We find that in Corinthians, Paul teaches us, excuse me, in Colossians, Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in Paul's humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen, they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on mere human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they like lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul here shows us that our walk is in Christ and not on a set of rules, not on man's instructions. Our second point has to do with exhortation. We're also commanded here, take my yoke. If we're to take on the yoke of Christ, we must put ourselves into a relationship with Christ as his servants and subjects to conduct ourselves accordingly. The yoke of Christ is not just a yoke from Christ, but it's a yoke with him. A yoke is fashioned for a pair, for a team of two, one for a team who are working together. It says, take my yoke upon you. This is a strange paradox that a man already weary, already overloaded, must take on a new weight in order to ease the, the stress and find rest. But this, is by, this advice is similar to what we find in Psalms 55, 22. Cast your cares on the Lord, for he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. The only way to live a Christian life is in total reliance upon the Lord, clinging to him by faith, admitting our helplessness and trusting on his sufficient strength. And so he calls us, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That leads us to our third point, the instruction and learn of me. It's been said that in training a young ox, 
is yoked to an older experienced ox. As much as the young ox may want to go in a different direction, the older one is there to keep the younger one on task. He's patient with the younger one. He doesn't fight with him. He just keeps working alongside, making sure that the work is accomplished. In much the same way, when we're yoked to Christ, we see that he, is, he not only bears the bulk of the burden, but he also keeps us on task so that we don't wander off in a totally different direction. Christ tells us to learn of me, to become his disciples. It's not only a matter of doing, but it's also a matter of being. By that, I mean that we take on the character of Christ. Christ said, I am meek and lowly in heart. This is where Christ himself describes his character. We also read in 2 Corinthians 10.1, the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. It is this character that brings rest to the soul and therefore gives us a reason why men should become his disciples. We must learn to take on the very character of Christ and his way of living. This leads us to our fourth point, the example. Christ says, I am meek and lowly of heart. You know, with pride and anger, there's mental labor and agony. But with meekness and humility, in Christ, all is smooth, even peaceable and quiet. For the work of the righteous is peace, quietness and assurance forever. Isaiah 32, 17 assures us of this, saying, The fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. The Lord Jesus was meek and lowly in heart. We're to learn from him. His entire life was spent living a life of a man that trusted entirely on God. And he did only those things that he heard from the Father. In like manner, when we take his yoke upon us and we learn to live in continuous dependency upon him, we too shall find rest for our souls. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Jesus lived a life in the way that God desires all of his children to live, in lowliness of spirit, in complete dependence upon the Father. He lived as a man is called to live in order to demonstrate to us how we should live in utter dependence upon him, knowing God in an intimate way, knowing Jesus Christ has sent us to accomplish his purposes. We see our fifth point, the outcome. We read, you will find rest for your souls. The outcome from following Christ's instruction is that we will live in peace. We will find rest for our souls. Many today are looking for rest for the body, mind and emotions, not realizing that much of that will come from a rested soul. How does that happen? The prophet Jeremiah shares in his, in his uh, prophecy from chapter 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. There's a declaration from God to his people asking them to walk in his ways and the outcome would be rest for their souls. They had an opportunity to find that rest. They, however, chose to follow their own ways and said, we will not walk in it. There's a warning and a promise of what God will do. This is somewhat illustrated in a story by John MacArthur that told of a plane that went down in Spain back in the 1980s. All were killed in that accident. 
when the black box was discovered and analyzed, it was discovered that the plane's alarm system had warned the pilot, warning him, pull up, pull up, pull up. The pilot's voice is heard to say, shut up. And then there's a large explosion. When we are warned and we choose to, con to continue following our own ways rather than God's ways, there's a sure outcome. We will have inner struggles because we will not be at peace in our heart. When we come to our last point here, the affirmation. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, there's a strong contradiction in that statement. The word for yoke in Hebrew is oel. It means burden. And it's used both literally and metaphorically. A yoke is meant as a means of getting more work out of a team of oxen. Yokes are heavy. They require strength and endurance. It's a kind of harness that's used for oxen to get them to pull a cart or farming equipment. Christ in his statement is saying, my burden is not too difficult. My heavy load is light. Burdens are not typically easy, nor are they light. Why would Christ use these words to describe a heavy, a heavy load? For one thing, a yoke in itself is a wooden beam that's heavy. Normally, a yoke is used between a pair of oxen or other animals to enable them to pull together on a load when they're working in pairs. Some yokes are fitted to individual animals. We are not meant to carry a heavy load alone. We are meant to walk alongside of our, of our Savior, of Christ. He's the one who carries us through these burdens that we often have to bear. He even has the yoke fitted to us, to our specific needs. Christ is affirming us, saying to us, you can do this because you're not doing this alone. You have me by your side. I will carry your burdens. I promise you that I will be there and be with you through all of this. How many of us have experienced God's amazing strength when we've had to face difficulties? But in order to learn from our teacher, we need to be yoked to him. He needs to lead us in the direction that we should go. He will show us how to face burdens and heavy situations. But all we need to do is look to our side and see that he's been there the whole time. Christ will lighten our loads and then make them easier to bear. I'd like to close reading Matthew 6, verses 25 through 36. In times of difficulty, in times when we're worrying, when we're preoccupied with the things around us, COVID, elections, bills, our whole world being changed, Let's consider what, what Matthew wrote to the people of that time and to us today. Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34 read, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes 
the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And we can certainly say amen to that. This morning I'd like to close just putting our lives in God's hands with the admonition to come to him, to not worry, but to cast our cares on him. He cares for us, but he asks us to take on his yoke. It is easy. It is light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how grateful we are for your word. How grateful we are for your promises. We pray and ask, Father, that you would be with the folks of Llano Grande. You know the things that they've gone through, even deciding if they should come back. I pray and ask, Father, that you would continue to protect them, each and every one, that you would minister to their needs. Bless them. Have your hand over them. We pray and ask, Father, that if there are any that have not trusted you as their personal Savior, do not have that close relationship with you, that they would just simply talk to you and say, Lord, I need you. I want you in my life. I want to take your yoke upon me. Lord, we pray that that you would do this, that you would do just that. Bless us now as we go on with our regular activities today and all that we do and say, may you be glorified through us. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Thank you so much. It's been good to share with you. Thank you.